Welcome to this week's episode of The County Seat. Once again, we are at the Utah State Capitol for our episode today. You know, it was here a couple of years ago that a new trend started. It was started as an extremely controversial bill called House Bill 148 that actually asked the federal government to give back the lands that were promised in the enabling documents of the Constitution. It had been discussed for eight or nine years prior to that that this was a question that legally should be vetted out. And it has gone from being a controversial bill to being a movement across the West and has actually gotten some feet under it. So we thought it would be wise at this point, almost on the two-year anniversary of the bill's passage, to come back and revisit uh, the transfer of public lands and how it is doing. Joining us for our conversation today, Representative Ken Ivory, the author of the original bill from District 47, and Commissioner Alan Gardner from Washington County. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Glad to be here. Okay, so since the governor signed this into law, uh, we've made quite a few hallmarks. One that comes to mind is that the following year there were some mechanisms for looking at how we would handle uh, the transfer of lands when the when the whole thing came to fruition there was some funding set aside to uh, uh, challenge it in court if need be what else is going on give us, give us an update it's hard to believe it's been uh, only two years uh, we've got five states and have now passed similar legislation to start looking at the logistics of having the federal government honor the same promise to our states uh, we have a full legal analysis done by the Federalist Society 40,000 constitutionally focused lawyers, scholars, professors, that what we're doing is legally, constitutionally, historically based. Several legal analyses have now been done. We have eastern states that are doing resolutions supporting the transfer of public lands to the western states. Republican National Committee did a unanimous resolution just a couple of weeks ago now, supporting the, the transfer of public news, lands. That's big news, is it not? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty big news because what, what, what the eastern states, what we're finding is they realize they're spending tens of billions of dollars to subsidize western states to not use our own lands and resources to care for our own kids and communities and there's 150 trillion dollars in mineral value locked up that that economic benefit helps the entire united states and so seeing that and the mess that we're in nationally eastern states are now gravitating as well it's kind of a surprise to me that that a week after the Republican National Committee gives this a lot of credibility that former Senator Bennett dismisses it as it being crazy talk in a in a an editorial in the Salt uh, the Deseret News. It just uh, shows you how much education needs to happen. Um, for someone who was in the U.S. Senate to not understand that we didn't give up our land, he made the statement that a governor of Utah was offered the land and gave it up in 1932. What they were offered was the surface and only the surface of, of the land, and the federal government would keep all the minerals. And Utah, along with all the other western states, banded together and rejected that false promise and said, no, you got to keep the whole promise, just like you did with all states east of Colorado. And so, you know, we've got education. We see that as an opportunity to continue to educate. If this is really a grassroots movement mm -hmm. uh, and not just a, a, a couple of resolutions that have been lobbied through, what evidence are you seeing of that as a county commissioner? Well, we're, we're seeing interest from counties all over uh, the, whole, the whole country. You know, we, uh, I, I carried a resolution to the National Associations of Counties uh, here two years ago, and it was re-upped uh, re this last year that called for the, uh, the transfer of the public lands. And one thing that I found really interesting this year is uh, I sit on the, uh, the public lands committee for the National Association, and each year we... Uh, you know, make a big list of things that, that we need to, that we see that need to happen and changes that need to be made, and then we prioritize those. And the first uh, first one was PILT and, and SRS were the first two, which are very important economically to the counties, are, are bribed for uh, having the, the federal lands. And uh, tied for number three was uh, payment in lieu of ta or n not payment in lieu of ta transfer, but the public. transfer of public lands. And so that's that's come a long ways in the, but the thing I pointed out to the commissioners, you know, if the, if the uh, public lands transferred and the states had control of them, the majority of that whole big list of issues we had would go away or we'd have a lot better control of them. And, and so, uh, you know, I think people are beginning to realize that that's really where the lands need to be is 
is here controlled by the states. We have now established that uh, uh, from some of these updates that it's becoming a movement that's broader than the states. Uh, but there's also a growing movement of people that think that this is really not a real issue and that we don't have a constitutional footing. We will talk with some of those people when we come back on the county seat. Skiing is expensive, right? Well, how about we do something about that? Eagle Point, Southern Utah's premier resort located right outside of Beaver, Utah, is proud to announce $25 lift tickets all season long. Ski and Snowboard Utah's newest resort for the lowest price and find out why The Point, with its family-friendly staff and great atmosphere, will become your second home. $25 lift passes all season. Go to EaglePointResort.com for eligibility and restrictions. Five lifts, 40 named runs, 1,500 vertical feet, endless possibilities. Eagle Point Resort. Almost 45% of the oil produced in Utah, 7.8 million barrels, comes from Duchesne County. That oil feeds our state economy, provides job growth, and supports local business. Here in Duchesne County, we're working to make Utah an economic, cultural, and technological leader. Whether you're here for business or pleasure, Duchesne County will welcome you with open arms and invite you to explore all the beauty of the Uinta Mountains. Duchesne County, close enough for business, far enough to get away. How would you spend an extra day in Utah Valley? day. Visit utahvalley.com to make reservations. Utah Valley, bring everyone together. Rediscover your sense of adventure. Welcome to San Juan County. Discover the past. A change of place. Utah San Juan County, where life is elevated. Welcome back to the county seat. Our topic today has uh, been on the Public Lands Transfer Act, commonly known as House Bill 148, and the fact that the clock is ticking. Uh, and while the uh, enthusiasm and the mission of the bill or the movement has spread to states, as we learned in the last segment, beyond just the boundaries of Utah, uh, there's also speculation that's growing as well as to whether it's actually uh, a feasible project. Joining us for that part of the discussion from the Hinckley Institute of Politics at the University of Utah, Tim Chambliss, and from the University of Utah Law School, the Quinney Law School, we have Bob Kiter. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Let me start with, with, with the question of um, your take on what's going to happen on January 1st, 2015. It was different than December 31st because that is a deadline that we're supposed to have something happen. Well, most likely nothing will happen that will be evident. Uh, it's unlikely that Congress is going to pass any legislation acknowledging uh, the Transfer of Public Lands Act that Utah has enacted, uh, and hence the ball will come back into the state's court, and it will have to decide whether or not to file a lawsuit uh, pressing this case. There have been some arguments that uh, that have been presented that are fairly convincing arguments that there is a constitutional legal footing for this to happen and that there are precedents that when piled, compiled together would um, make that uh, a, a, a viable argument. Well, the, the case really turns upon uh, two issues. Uh, one is whether or not the federal government, Congress, is uh, obligated uh, under the Utah enabling legislation that created Utah as a state to uh, extinguish uh, or dispose of uh, the federal lands that it has uh, retained since uh, statehood. Um, and the second question is, uh, if there is uh, indeed an obligation, then uh, does Congress have the authority uh, as it has, uh, through ordinary legislation, uh, the Federal Land Policy Management Act uh, particularly, uh, to uh, ignore or overturn uh, that obligation. That authority of Congress turns upon uh, its authority under the Property Clause of the U.S. Constitution, and the Supreme Court has said that uh, that power is basically without limitation. Uh, so it is an extraordinarily powerful uh, authority 
uh, to oversee, uh, dispose of if it chooses, uh, or otherwise retain and manage uh, the federal lands. Uh, jumping back for a quick second to the state enabling uh, legislation, uh, there's conflicting uh, language uh, in that legislation. Uh, much of it uh, focuses upon the state's, uh, uh, the language that says that the state will um, <clears throat> relinquish uh, all claim and title to the federal lands. Uh, whether or not, uh, given that language, there's a corresponding uh, duty uh, or an overriding duty on the part of the federal government to dispose of those lands uh, actually turns upon some of history regarding federal land policy at that point in time and how it has changed since then. Well, Tim, let's, let's look at the political environment because there is a constitutional issue, and as we t discussed just before we started this uh, segment here, that, that there are people who are even in the camp that say, yeah, wouldn't that be good, and there's a good argument, but they don't think it'll ever happen. How does the political environment play into Well, it? I tend to think problem-solution. We have a problem. Utah state government has a budget of $13.3 billion a year. If we look at how that budget is broken down, we see that more than half of the uh, budget is dedicated to public education. You can add to that higher education. If we look just at public education with a population of less than 3 million people for the state of Utah, about 97 percent of our school kids, kindergarten through 12, attend public school, taxpayer supported. And we see that uh, uh, in order to bring Utah's level of education up to the quality it should be, we, it's estimated we need at least $2 billion more to bring uh, to to have good schools, well-paid teachers, excellent facilities, and a lower teacher-student ratio. So, uh, where are we going to get that money? Uh, Representative Ivory has said, "Let's sue the federal government. Let's uh, have access to these lands." Well, litigation takes time. It's expensive. It's going to probably cost a lot more than three million dollars, uh, and uh, chances are, historically, if you predict the immediate future off the recent past, after a good a good deal of time, the state will lose. At one point, some of the other states, which had very similar enabling language, they actually got Congress, I believe Missouri, Illinois, that whole area there, they went and lobbied and basically it was one senator that said, hey, this isn't right, we're supposed to be disposing of federal lands, and they got it done. And it, Could that argument not be applied to the West? Well, we're looking at 2014, 2015, and we can all see the cooperation uh, in the National Legislature, the Congress. Uh, and we can see that in the past year, in 2013, Congress passed 53 significant bills. Uh, Harry Truman back in 1947 called that 80th Congress that do-nothing Congress. That Congress passed more than 400 bills. So we see Congress in deadlock right now. We don't see significant legislation being passed. And what we're talking about here is really historically significant le legislation. So I guess that goes back to just prior to the Taylor Grazing Act, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was some talk about the, you know, the federal lands out here and that they were arid and the federal government, I guess at one point Utah supposedly was offered them and they didn't want to take them. Uh, there was a uh, public land commission uh, under uh, the during the administration of President Herbert Hoover, who uh, came up with uh, proposals to, uh, in fact, return uh, federal lands in the western states uh, to um, uh, the states. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the states indicated that they uh, were not interested in them. That was driven uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, probably, principally. The lands were in very poor condition at that time, hence the Taylor Grazing Act a year later. Uh, and also, um, the lands really uh, were not uh, all that valuable. And that really goes back to your other uh, question about Missouri and some of the states further east and the fact that they uh, no longer um, have uh, significant federal lands. Uh, most of those lands actually uh, moved from federal hands into private hands through laws like the Homesteading Acts. Uh, and uh, similar types of legislation uh, during the middle part of the 19th century. And they moved because uh, the lands had some value. They could be used and developed for agricultural purposes. Prior to Taylor grazing, there wasn't part of the argument uh, really centered around the fact that, that they were talking about surface rights being transferred and not subsurface rights or mineral rights? 
Beginning shortly after the uh, turn of the 20th century, uh, the federal government began uh, splitting uh, estates, uh, transferring surface rights, retaining mineral rights, and subsequently transferring uh, those uh, at a later time or retaining them, uh, which means that the actual land ownership patterns today uh, are quite complex uh, on uh, the public lands and even on some of the lands that are uh, privately owned, where you have federal mineral rights and sorting all of that out through a transfer of public lands uh, act uh, like Utah has adopted would be a very complex uh, matter and in fact it's been an argument against the transfer in some of the state legislatures that have considered the matter. Well as you can see it's very complex uh, and that there are a lot of issues that still remain on the table. We'll return with our conversation and look at some of the mechanical procedures that are set to go forward from this point to the end of the year and then beyond when we return on the county seat. Stay with us. What brings you to St. George? Business meeting. Staying long? Just here for the day. Quick in and out. Hey, I just landed. Can we meet in half an hour? Not too bad. Why so fast? Stay any longer? We'll run out of things to do. <laughs> on second thought. <gasps> Buddy, something's come up. I'm gonna need another hour. Can we push the meeting till noon? <laughs> I am definitely gonna need to reschedule. Holy... Sit back, relax, and enjoy your 45 minute flight to Salt Lake. How'd that meeting go? I should have booked a weekend. In San Rafael country, you'll discover more adventure and excitement than you can imagine. And it's only two hours from the Wasatch Front. Find gorges that descend thousands of feet, trails that go on forever, and the solitude of finding a place all your own. Emory County and the San Rafael Swell we're closer than you think. Cedar City, Utah is home of the Tony Award winning Utah Shakespeare Festival. But did you know that we also offer a different kind of play? Escape the Gray. Head south for clear skies. Cedar City, Bryanhead. Welcome back to the county seat. Today we are talking about the transfer of public lands. It started as a bill, House Bill 148, in case you're just joining us, uh, has now been in effect in Utah for a couple of years and has started to spread um, rather rapidly across the West and as we learned in our first segment across the nation. But there are people, as we found in our last segment, that don't believe that we have a legitimate legal standing. You've obviously debated this issue with uh, Professor Keiter before, and, and, and he has talked about the fact that all Western states have the same, all these arid states have the same language in their enabling documents. And you've pointed out that their Eastern states have the same basic language. Uh, what would be the difference? Good question. Promises are the same. And so uh, what really set this off, Chad, was in 2009, there's a unanimous Supreme Court opinion that says Congress doesn't have the authority to simply change that uniquely sovereign character of our, our enabling act, our statehood, particularly where all of our public lands are at stake. And then there's other Supreme Court cases, uh, Utah versus Andrus, where the Supreme Court has called these enabling acts solemn compacts something way more than just a contract. It's a contract between sovereigns that they said is, that has rights and obligations that are enforceable on both sides. And that's all we're looking at is just keep the same promise. And we'd much rather have a negotiated orderly transfer, keep the national parks off the table, monuments, wilderness, protect those for everyone, um, and, and continue to maintain those in that, in that standpoint. But honor your promise, just, just like you kept with Louisiana and Alabama and Nebraska and North and South Dakota, they have the exact same language in their state of documents. So, Alan, do you think that this is the, that the, the problem that people are having grasping this that continue to, 
to write or talk about the implausibility, that it's just a perceptual thing as opposed to being a legally founded thing. Was, well, how could the government change? It's always been this way. And I, and I think that's the issue that a lot of people have, well, especially, you know, we've got a whole generation or two that's grown up with this being public lands and we've never been taught or realized that it should have been given back to the states. And uh, I, I think it's all a perception that uh, people have just let slip by. Who was the, wh which was the last state that joined the Union, and you may not know this question, that actually got most all of their undesignated lands returned to the state or disposed of by the federal government? Yeah, you have to go yeah. all the way back, back to, to 1959. Hawaii got Hawaii. all of theirs. When they came in right off the bat, they gave them all their lands. It says right in their Enabling Act that the United States hereby grants directly to the state of Hawaii title to all the public lands, title which is held by the United States immediately prior to their admission. Because the native Hawaiians didn't want a government tens of you know, thousands of miles away ruling over their lands, and so they mobilized, they activated, they exercised their political franchise and power and compelled Congress to transfer their lands. That's the exact same thing that Illinois and Missouri and Arkansas and Louisiana and those states did when they were 90% federally controlled for decades, they activated their power from the people up and compelled all of their representatives in Congress and taught throughout the United States and compelled Congress to transfer their lands and they're now all less than 5% federally controlled. Some people say Civil War is the trigger, but apparently there were some transfers after the Civil War. Yeah, a lot of transfers after the Civil War. In fact, in 1930s, the early 1930s, the states had pushed again and drove congressional hearings. And the title of the congressional hearings were granting remaining unreserved public lands to the states. Not if, just how. Now that's where the federal government said, hey, we'll give you the surface. We'll keep our promise and give you the surface. We're just gonna keep all the minerals, all the really valuable stuff. And the states said, no, we're, gonna, we're, we're not gonna accept a half a promise. You have to keep all your promise. And that led to the Taylor Grazing Act as a stopgap. And the Taylor Grazing Act, Chad, the first line of the Taylor Grazing Act in 1934 said, this is just to promote the highest use of the public lands pending its final disposal. And then that changed in 76. 1976. 76. So how, do you, uh, how does one move forward with this? I mean, is, is, ob if obviously you're stating facts. I have no reason to suspect that you are telling me a fib, but nobody seems to want to believe it. Well, we'd encourage people to go to the AmericanLandsCouncil.org website. There's all kinds of information there, legal white papers, articles, studies, studies that show the states economically more effectively manage public lands than the federal government. I mean, it's not even close. Environmentally, uh, we've got issues. There's a great video of the Montana governor, pretty liberal Democrat, saying, look, in the states, we have 5% of the forested land. We yield 15% of the harvest. We still protect protected species, but on the federal side, burning down the forest, endangering species, killing habitat, destroying watershed. Um, and so environmentally, economically, we can't afford not to. Well, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we'll ask a question in regards to uh, a follow-up to that. Uh, good conversation on the transfer of public land. Stay with us here on the county seat. Kanab, base camp for your Southern Utah adventures. in Kanab. The best part about raising children here in, the, in Vernal in the Una Basin is just the smaller community that makes you feel like when you go somewhere you know everybody. So we packed up our three kids and here we came to Una County and what a great place it was. What a great move. Great schools, great outdoor activities. Just a really great place to raise your family. My father, he was an engineer for Chevron, retired 39 some odd years. And Jeff, my husband, it's the same way. He's always worked in the oil and gas, always had a job here. And with that industry, when it does good, the whole valley thrives. UNA Basin's been fantastic in supporting what we've tried to do both as a business and also in the development of mountain bike trails and the sport of mountain biking. I'm able to run up to a beautiful place like this and spend some good quality time. It's one of the big reasons why I live where I live. And that makes it just a wonderful place to have little ones like this. 
Check out these pictures from my vacation. Where did you go again? Garfield County, you know, like Bryce Canyon, Devil's Rock Garden. Where's that? Capitol Reef, Kodachrome Basin, Highway 12. Wait a minute, I wanted to see more. A picture may be worth a thousand words, but there's nothing like experiencing the real thing firsthand. Gather your family and see the world's largest concentration of scenic attractions. Garfield County, Utah, find the ultimate adventure. Welcome back to the county seat. Our topic today has been the transfer of public lands and uh, the, the fact that the movement has spread. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's certain arguments that persist on this. One of them is, well, we're going to privatize all the land and that the state legislature can't be trusted to um, protect public lands and they will all be sold off. And of course, you know, with the selling off the prison, that's kind of reignited that conversation. What say you? Well, I, I think that is a big concern for a lot of people out there. I've, I've heard a lot of comments on that as well, but that is not the goal. The goal is to get it transferred to the state and it would remain in state management. There may be a few isolated parcels that get sold off to the to individuals or particularly around communities or something like that as, as they grow and need some, some room to expand. But the goal is to have these lands in state control where we can manage them by the state and still have the the grazing, the mining, the recreation, the things that we're using them for now, we'll continue to be able to use them for in the future. Well, and, and what is the state legislature doing to, to that end to prove that that doesn't happen? Yeah, the short answer on that, federal public lands become state public lands for multiple use, sustain you with local planning. And so this year there's a, a public lands caucus that has formed House and Senate members, Kevin Stratton, representative out of Utah County is, is chairing that and leading, leading the charge. We're going to have a uh, public land stewardship commission bill that's going through um, interstate compact where we start coordinating our efforts with other states. Steve Handy has a bill on what wilderness characteristics would look like under state management, the lands that we preserve and take off the table and protect and, and keep as, as, as open space. Uh, we have bills dealing with the national park shutdown. Representative Noel has some bills dealing with uh, the stating the issue going forward and encouraging our members of Congress on the actions we need them to take uh, for the state of Utah. It really is encouraging, Chad, that this year I'm, I'm running education bills this year. I'm, I'm helping and supporting and working, but we have a public lands caucus where we have many shoulders carrying the load now, and, it, and, and that's happening all around the western United States. And education is a big part of this, and I, I would like to encourage you, you, you will hear people on both sides of this issue, and these gentlemen have made some very good claims. I'm challenging you as the citizens of this state, the viewers of this program, to find out for yourself. You can go to Ken's website, you can, uh, you can find out information through the Hinckley Institute of Politics, you can look at different points of view and perspective, but get informed because you are the people that will drive our future. As we always say, local government is where your life happens. Be part of the solution. Thank you for watching The County Seat. You can watch it again and share it with your friends through Facebook and online. We'll see you next week.